continue our lessons from the Gospel of Mark in chapter 13. We're just going to read portions of chapter 13 and then jump back to a reference in chapter 13 to the prophet Daniel. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Then he went out of the temple. One of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must, must happen. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles, and there will be... Uh, and these are just the beginnings of sorrows. But watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues, you will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand, or premeditate what you shall speak. But whatever is given you in that moment, in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of the house. These instructions continue for quite a while, but I want to reiterate the final verse, saying, And what I say to you, I say to you all, watch. We also read from the book of Daniel, chapter 9. In verses 11 and 12, and then 26 and 27. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as to not obey your voice. Therefore the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out onto us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven, such has never has been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. And in verse 26, after the, the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary the end of it shall be within a, with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. Even until the consummation, which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Final lessons are taken from the word for the new church in the work Arcana Celestia. 
in Numbers 33.53 and 33.54. says that the majority of people believe that when the last judgment comes, everything that is visible in this world will perish. That is to say that the earth will go up in flames, the sun and moon will be reduced to nothing, and the stars will disappear. And after that, a new heaven and a new earth will come into being. They have acquired this idea from the prophetical revelations, among which some, occurrences, some of these occurrences are mentioned. But what will in fact happen at this time is quite different. The last judgment is nothing else than the end of the church with one group of people and the beginning of it with another. This end with one and the beginning with another occurs when the Lord is not acknowledged any longer, or what amounts to the same, when there is no faith any longer. No acknowledgement or faith exists any longer when there is no charity any longer. For faith is in no way possible except with those in whom charity is present. In those circumstances, the church comes to an end and is transferred to others, as is plainly evident from all things that the Lord himself taught and foretold in the Gospels concerning the last day or the end of the age in Matthew 24 or Mark 13 and also in Luke 21. But since nobody without the key, which is the internal sense of Scripture, is able to understand these things that are foretold by him, let them here be explained. This passage does go on to explain each individual part. For just a portion of that, we'll read from the next line. These individual meanings show what the Lord's words are used to mean, namely, the first state of the perversion of the church, which occurs when people cease to know any longer what good is and what truth is, and instead, they argue with one another about it about what truth is. And this gives rise to falsities. But because this is only the first state, it is said that the end is not yet, and that these are the beginning of sorrows, and that state is referred to as earthquakes in various places, which in the internal sense means an alteration of the state of the church, a partial or initial alteration. The fact that this was told to the disciples means that it was addressed to everyone who belongs to the church, for the twelve disciples represent these. This is what explains why they were told, see that no one leads you astray, and also when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not alarmed. Here end our lessons. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It's a, an interesting thing to start at the end of the chapter, but that is such a powerful thing for the Lord to say. What I say to you, speaking to the disciples, I say to all, I say to all, what, what I say to you, I say to all. So that means that everything that the Lord spoke in this chapter is not just addressed for that time, but for all times. So when the Lord is talking to the disciples, let's, let's start here. The Lord is talking to the disciples and he says, this generation shall by no means pass away before these things take place. Is that talking about the disciples' generation? This generation shall by no means pass away before these things happen. When did the earth... Um, have all of these problems where the sun doesn't give its light, the moon uh, and Daniel were told that this is supposed to happen by the flood. Um, we're supposed to have wars and rumors of wars, right? Which ones? Which wars? 
Which rumors of wars? Hasn't that always been the case? Since human beings are like constantly struggling for power and land and, and stuff and food, there's always wars and rumors of wars. What I say to you, I say to all, watch. What generation is he talking to? This generation. When we read the Lord's word, it's very easy. And, and the writings acknowledge this in the passage we read. It says, look, people have come up with these concepts, a very natural concept of what this end of the age is going to look like, that it's going to be the destruction of the earth. It says people get this because that's what it seems to say in the literal sense of Scripture. But how could that be the case if we're trying to say that this generation, meaning the disciples' generation, shall by no means pass away, and yet what the Lord is saying, He is saying to all. And here we are, 2,000 some odd years later. How can it be both? The only way it can be both is that if that end of days is an individual occurrence and an occurrence that happens on any church that is falling away from the Lord's principles. This is a big topic because it, if we go outside of people who know of the writings, this is a hard topic. We don't know. What, what do we do with these words? Uh, let's even back up. Let's go back to the prophets in Daniel and in Isaiah where similar things were said. That the sun would be darkened, the moon would not give its light, the stars would fall from the heavens. In Revelation, it says it again. These are images of when the church, the people who are suppo supposed to possess faith in the Lord and charity in the Lord have fallen away, that the sun will no longer give its light, is that there is no love for the Lord anymore. When there is no love inspiring our actions, the church has no purpose. And when there is no love, there is no real faith. There are just facts. So the moon begins to not give its life because faith no longer has love in it. And the stars, the next thing, Ideas that lead us to understand faith, which make us learn how to love, no longer have power. The ideas that the Lord has given us in his word are his stars. When these things are happening, it's a demonstration of what happens when a church falls away from its central purpose, which is to lead people to the Lord. Because he is the only one who saves. He is the only one who can bring us out of this very materialistic state of mind to see that life is more that life is greater than these things. Now this happens at many different times. We have the very big ones where we might look at, well, when we look at Daniel, it says this is going to end in a flood. Well, if we go back to Genesis, we have a flood. There's Noah's flood. That was a judgment on a church that had done the same thing. It had fallen away from its love to the Lord and fallen away from the real faith that leads us to charity. That's the story of Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden because they weren't following what God commanded them. They had fallen away from love of the Lord and so following his commandments. Instead, they looked at themselves and looked at each other and went, oh, how do I love me and how do I use God to love me? That's being kicked out of the garden, and a flood occurs. That church comes to an end because a church that is not connected with God cannot survive. So we do have a flood of some sort where no longer are truths represented by water actually giving us truth, but it's an inundation of falsity that causes people's spiritual lives to be suffocated. The next really big one that we look at is when the Lord came into the world. And we look at all of the prophecies of what's going to happen, and it's all of these catastrophic things, it seems. But how do we account for the fact that the Lord says, what I say to you, I say to all? It's because it's this generation, no matter who's reading it. It's your generation, my generation, not the generation. It's this state of mind that we are in. 
The Lord is speaking to the disciples because he is speaking to people who would like to be a part of his church, that are making an effort to live the way he teaches. And this is a warning from him. It's a warning to be on guard, to be ready for when, when the Lord comes. This is an interesting thing. When the Lord comes, when does the Lord come? There's been prophecies that everybody, what if I said every single time somebody has predicted the end or that, that the Lord, the Son of Man is coming, that they were right? Because on that day, somebody's going through it. Somebody is going through this state of vastation. The end of a church sounds like a very terrible thing. Uh, and, and in our own personal lives, if we think about this being a reference to me inside, it is. It feels like death. It feels that way. It feels like our world is crashing down. It seems like there is no love in our life, where we don't actually have any direction from faith. We feel lost in these moments when we don't know what to do. The Lord's still fighting on our behalf. We said with the children that he had the, the disciples, Peter, James, and John, sitting there and tells them, watch, be on guard. And who's coming to get him? That's Judas and all of the, the scribes. Who, that's, they're supposed to be on guard for the people who are coming to attack the Lord, to, to take him and crucify him. What is this in our lives? Like I said to the children, this has reference to when we know something that is true, and then we're put into, into a position where we are challenged to either live the way that that teaches or to live our own way. And I think everybody in here has been in that position where you know you're doing something wrong, where your conscience says, how did you do that again, you idiot? Unfortunately, our minds go into calling ourselves names. But it, this happens. We know more truth then we live. This is always going to be the case, hopefully. Because it's that knowledge that can raise up our minds to see a little bit more of what the Lord does, and then we can force ourselves to live that way. Our will is then compelled to live in accordance with the Lord's teachings, to compel ourselves to abide by His commandments. This is what the Lord is saying, I do not fall asleep or be on guard, be aware it's interesting that word that uh, is translated watch, meaning so he says, what I say to you, I say to all, and it says watch, that, that word is not with our eyes. It's not watching with your eyes. It really is a be on guard. Be ready for the attack. One of the hardest parts to contemplate about this is that in general, we're going to fail. This is one of the weirdest messages of the gospel to me. He tells Peter, James, and John, the most loved disciples, it seems, the ones that are always with him, do this, and they don't. He comes back three times, meaning it, it is complete. They would have never done it. They would have never stayed awake, meaning we don't have the power to compel ourselves very well, but the Lord has that power. This is one of the very powerful things about this part of the Lord's story is the constant failure of everyone around the Lord. Everyone. Even those closest to Him. And yet the Lord succeeds. Our series is called Coming to Know Jesus Through Mark. And this is something that we really need to know about Jesus. Jesus. He is God. He is the only one who has the power to overcome. That we by ourselves cannot, that we will succumb in temptation unless we can put our faith into the Lord. It's, it's been interesting kind of going through this, this gospel, and we kind of jumped ahead a little bit 
to, to capture the crucifixion and resurrection for Easter, and now we're coming back. That, that crucifixion and resurrection, the crucifixion is the end result of us not choosing to live the way the Lord teaches us, even though we know it's right. The Lord says that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Meaning, even when we want to, we won't have the power. This is not a depressing thing. It feels depressing to think, I have no power. But it's actually a very freeing thing. This is how different it is. This is night and day, asleep and awake, different kind of thinking. When we recognize our powerlessness for the first time, we have true power. Because we can turn it over to the Lord. The image of I need to have enough power, that's a nighttime, that's a sleep. I don't have power, but the Lord does, that's being awake. So when we're in that moment and, and the Lord seems to not be present because he's gone off to do his job that we're kind of unaware of what the Lord's doing in the background of our own problems, are we willing in that moment because temptations are going to come if it's about not lying, I know I'm not supposed to lie, and yet I'm in deep trouble if I don't lie, and I think I can get out of it. That's when the Lord's saying, beware, watch, be on guard. That's an attack, not on you, but on God. In all of these things, it says that, the, that you're going to be delivered up to the synagogues, and they're going to... to um, persecute you, they're going to scourge you, they're going to do a whole bunch of bad things to you in my name, the Lord says. This is when we stand in the principles of God, despite what anybody else tells us. It's hard to know if we, we actually know what, what God is saying, but so we kind of have to have a humility in that. But when we know what God teaches, and the rest of the world is saying, yeah, but, remember last week we were talking about all the yeah, but, and what if questions, to be firm in our beliefs is not to say, I have the power to do everything good that is put into my life. It's knowing that God has the power and that I don't. Be on guard. So when that temptation comes up, let's think about what the Lord tells them. And this is where we're going to leave it for this morning. What is the instruction that the Lord gives to the disciples about when this takes place? gives us three things. I lost my place, so I'm going to find it again. He tells us to watch. I'm sorry, I'm missing this exact verse. And the final one is pray. Here it is. Take heed. Verse 33. Take heed, watch, and pray. For you don't know when it's going to happen. Take heed, watch, and pray. When we're in these circumstances where we know what's true, we're tempted to do something different, and we're told by the Lord to stay awake, these are our instructions. Take heed, watch, and and pray. Take heed is go back to his word. Confirm that truth for yourself. Take heed means listen to what the Lord says. That's once we know what's right and wrong, re reaffirm that in our hearts. Yep, lying is still wrong. Then we can go watch. Watch in my mind when I'm tempted not to. When I'm tempted to not live according to that commandment and lie. And then pray. This is something that I think we don't do enough of when we're feeling tempted to simply ask the Lord, help me not lie. It's a very simple thing to do. But I challenge you to try it. When you're really feeling, I want to lie, and I know it's wrong, Lord, help me not lie. Whatever it is, help me not do this. Help me to do this. Take heed, 
watch, and pray. What I say to you, I say to all. The whole concept of the end of the world is a discussion for another day. The simple version of it is that what happened at the end of a church or at the end of a concept of how to live, whether that is historical, meaning the end of the Garden of Eden, or the end of the Israelitish church, or the end of the Christian church, whatever that is, it's when people fall away from love to the Lord and faith in Him and living the way He teaches. That can happen on an individual basis. It can happen on a church-wide basis. This is not some big apocalyptic thing that will happen at some point. But take heed now. This generation shall by no means pass away before these things take place. Take heed, watch, and pray. Amen. Please rise. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.